Now, not to confuse you. Now, if that is not enough, we have to worry about the remainder part of the grant as well. A remainder is a right to some type of future ownership. And when we talk about remainders, there's actually two types. You either going to have a vested remainder or contingent remainder. With a vested remainder, it exists when we know who owns it and he has no condition he must first meet. For example, to B, then to A. Our remainder is going to be A. A contingent remainder, on the other hand, exists when we do not know who will receive it or there is a condition that that person must meet before he can become the owner. And when that condition is finally met or the owner has been identified, then the remainder best. To be on his 21st birthday is an example. The problem with contingent remainders is that we just can't have land that is not owned by anybody. So in order to be valid, these contingent remainders must vest before life estate ends. Again, so if you have a contingent remainder, you're dealing with life estates, there's going to be a general problem. You got to make sure that that contingent remainder vests before the life estate ends. If it doesn't, then that contingent remainder actually fails. Let me give you an example. I'm going to say to A for life, then to B on his 21st birthday. And what if B is only five when A dies? What happens to the property? Another rule that applies to contingent remainders is this old rule against perpetuities. This rule gives a maximum length of time in which a contingent remainder might possibly vest. Now, if there is any possibility that the contingent remainder will vest, but it will do so so far in the future, then the remainder will not be even be given an effect. What is the maximum time limit for a person in being to be identified? So we're saying there's lives in being. Then you add some time frame plus 21 years. If not, then that remainder will be void. So the rule against perpetuities actually states the following. It states, no interest in property is valid unless it must vest, if at all, not later than 21 years after one or more lives in being at the creation of the interest. I think the rule might be more easily understood if we have been expressed in more of an affirmative proposition. So let me try that. An interest is void if there is any possibility, however remote, that the interest may vest more than 21 years after some life and being at the creation of the interest. Now my paraphrase of the rule properly places the emphasis on the possibility of remote vesting. What does this mean? This means that if a situation can be imagined in which the interest might not vest within the perpetuities period, then that interest is going to be void. You have to note that this is the result, even though the circumstances might bring about the remote vesting or unlikely to occur, or even if it's unrealistic. Now, what type of future interest are we talking about that you have to apply this rule to. The rule applies to contingent remainders, executory interests, and others that we're not even gonna focus on in this course. But let me just stress some things. Now, let's dissect it just a little bit more. When does the perpetuities period begin? It begins at the time the interests are created. This means that the lives in being plus 21 years period begins to run and the measuring lives used to show the validity of an interest must be existed at that time. For example, if we're dealing with a will, the perpetuities period begins to run on the date of the testator's death. What if you're talking about a deed? What if it's not a will, but it's a deed? Now, in the case of a deed, perpetuities period begins to run on the date the deed is delivered with the intent to pass title. All right. Now, let's talk about another concept, this concept of must vest. So, to be valid under the rule, the RAP rule, the rule against perpetuities, it must be shown that the interest created in the transferee must vest, regardless of what might happen, within lives in being plus 21 years. So, we again have to determine when does the interest become vested? 
So let's talk about it. An interest become vested when, number one, when it becomes a present possessory estate, or number two, when it becomes an indefeasibly vested remainder. We'll define that in a little bit. Number three, or a vested remainder subject to total divestment. All right, let me back up a bit. So we said present possessory interest in the feasibly vested remainder. Now, in the feasibly vested remainder means that each estate is created in a person who is both in existence and ascertainable at the time the conveyance creating such an interest becomes into existence. The interest is also going to be defined as in the feasibly vested because it occurs when automatically at the natural termination of a previous estate. I'll give you an example later on to clarify. What about a vested remainder subject to total divestment? What does that mean? This means that this interest is created when a vested remainder is given not to a named person, but to a class of persons, and that class may be added to. This is where we get at the concept about subject to open, which simply means that the title is shared by a person who may be added to the class. Remember that the rule is applicable only to future interest created in whom? We said third persons. So consequently, the rule generally applies only to contingent remainders, executory interests, investment remainders that are subject to open and divestment. All right, let me give you some few examples. To A for life, then to A's children for their lives. And on the death of the last survivor of A's children, to B. And be simple. Let me repeat that. To A for life, then to A's children for their lives, and on the death of the last survivor of A's children, then to B in fee simple. Here are some facts. At the time of this disposition, A has two very young children and is quite capable of having more children in the future. So let's go through our test. Does A have a present possessory estate? Yes. A has a present possessory life estate. So what is the deal with A's children? Let me explain this to you. A's present children have vested remainders in life estate that are subject to open. Why do I say that? Because A may decide to have more children in the future. And because those children have a favorable interest in the state as well. Okay. Let's talk a little bit more about these possible future unborn children of A. Don't they have a future interest that is based on the possibility of A giving birth to them? Meaning their interest is contingent upon their birth, right? Okay, so we can define them as contingent remainders in A's life estate. Now let's look at B. What type of interest does B possess? Look at the language. To be in fee simple. So is it safe to say that B's interest may be classified as a remainder? But would you consider him a vested remainder or contingent remainder? He's a vested remainder in fee simple. So according to the information we discussed thus far, would the rule affect B's estate? No. So B's interest is valid under the rule, even though it may be years before B or her successors is entitled to present possession and enjoyment of the property, even though B or her successors may not succeed to present possession and enjoyment until the death of some person not now in being like the future born child of A who may be the last survivor of A's children. Why? B's interest is valid under the rule because it is an indefeasibly vested remainder from the time of its creation. All right, let's talk about another concept of the route rule. What do we mean about if at all? This simply means that the interest does not have to vest within the perpetuities period in order to be valid. After all, Many contingent remainders never vest because the condition precedent to their taking is not satisfied. In other words, if at all means that if the contingent interest is absolutely certain 
either to vest or fail entirely within the period of the rule, it is valid. Let me express this in an example. For example, grantor to A for life and on A's death to B if B is D in living. Let's look at A first. What does A possess? A has a life estate. What does B possess? B has a contingent remainder. Is there anyone else who may have an interest? Uh, yes. What about that grantor? The person that gave the property to A. He actually has a reversion. In this case, B may never take for she may predecease A. But if B does take, if at all, her interest will vest. Here at that moment, B's interest may become a possessory interest. But when? What else must occur? On A's death is when we will know whether B has survived A. So in this case, B is her own life in being. For the condition precedent to be taken must occur if it does occur within B's lifetime. B's interest is valid under the rule. Lives in being is another concept under the rat rule. The law allows any lives to be used to show the validity or invalidity of an interest, but no lives are of any help unless they are somehow connected with the vesting of an interest. The measuring lives need not be given a beneficial interest in the property, and they need not even be expressly referred to in the instrument, but there must be some connection that ensures vesting or failure of the interest within the perpetuities period. Let's look at an example. Here's a sample disposition in a testator's will. To such of my nephews and nieces as attain the age of 21. At the time of the testator's death, let's say she has two brothers and six nephews and nieces, all of whom are under the age of 21. Is the gift valid under the rap rule? You know the legal answer is, it depends. Specifically, it depends on whether T's parents are living. What? So the relevant measuring lies are actually T's brothers and sisters. Why? Because all of T's nephews and nieces will obtain 21, if at all, within 21 years after their parents' death. If T's parents are dead, her two brothers or all the brothers she's ever going to have. And T's nephews and nieces will be the children of these brothers. The disposition is valid. But if T's parents are alive, then they may have another child. A brother, a sister of T, not alive at T's death. Then T's two brothers and six nephew and nieces who were alive at T's death might die. Then T's possible future brother or sister might have a child who lives to attain age 21, which is more than 21 years after any life and being. Since this might happen, the disposition is invalid under the rat rule. Now, let me clarify who can actually be used as measuring lives. Humans only. No animals, no organizations. Again, only humans can be used. Also, the number of measuring life must be reasonable. I'm going to give you an example. The conveyance will terminate 21 years after the death of the survival of all the persons listed in the New York County Telephone Directory. This is clearly impermissible. There's actually been some perpetuities reform. While the common law rules against perpetuities continues to apply in many states, in recent years, criticism of the rule has led to various reforms, and the most common are the following. Age contingency, administrative contingency, gifts to persons by the title rather than by name, weight and C, year limitation. Let's just cover a few. Let's talk about the weight and C doctrine. 
The essence of this reform is that the validity of the contingent interest is determined not on the basis of facts as they exist when the interest was created, but on the basis of facts as they actually occur. Therefore, if a non-vested interest actually vests or fails to vest in a timely manner, the interest is good under the rule. Since this reform applies only to interests that would otherwise violate 